Kevin Orr, a wheelchair rugby coach for the bronze medal squad in Japan. Really good to see you, my friend. It's been a long time. Really good to see you too, Bob. It's been a very, very long time, maybe 30 years. Well, maybe even more. I know that we probably got in touch with you at the U of I, but Kevin, I remember all the way back to our days in Seoul. And uh, boy, that first Paralympics in 1988, long ago as it was, it really stuck out in my memory. How about yours? Absolutely. Uh, everything from the crowds that they had with the school children to everywhere we went getting autographs. Uh, just a great experience all in all for Paralympics. Yeah, there was so much I remember about that, uh, none of which for me personally was the track, but you had a pretty successful career as a, as a racer. Uh, I was, uh, you know, having to refresh myself, but you have a bronze in both the 8 and the 5,000. That's pretty impressive, my man. Yeah, it was, uh, it, it was a good competitive field, uh, you know, different classification system back then, but uh, the people in my classification group were certainly... Uh, uh, among the, the top of the peers of wheelchair racing, and really uh, it was an honor to compete against them for sure. All right, Kevin, so you come back to uh, the States, and it's time to crack down and go to school, finish up your degree. You get a degree in therapeutic recreation, and uh, lo and behold, it doesn't take all too long before you get involved with a cutting-edge program at Lakeshore Foundation and get involved in rugby. Yeah, I started a program. It was actually one of the goals of my internship was to start a wheelchair rugby program. Uh, it didn't happen during my internship, but uh, it, it really took about two years. And with the help of the Shepherd Center and their coach, David Loy, and their team, really it helped uh, the team in Birmingham get started. And uh, really, that's how networking goes. Uh, Burt Burns, who was a wheelchair racer, was one of the players on that team. Uh, Bill Furbish, another uh, wheelchair athlete. Um, you know, the networking that we had in our sport really uh, helped push uh, me into coaching and really helped me get my foot on the right track. Did you find it kind of odd that uh, as a, as more or less a pair or someone of full use of your arms that you got involved so heavily with the quad group? Well, you know, the, the interesting thing is, is I, you know, I have that Les Autres disability, so um you know, the idea of somewhat being ostracized by paras, um, you know, we all kind of fall into our niche group, I suppose. Um, but then the, the completion of the classification system really helped me really see the whole picture as far as what was available for wheelchair sports. Um, so seeing wheelchair rugby just fascinated me as far as the contact and, you know, the, the different ability levels of athletes that, with, with limited function, um, that really fascinated me more than uh, competing. And, and to me, that was the, the idea of starting a wheelchair rugby club here in Birmingham and, and really continuing my career. So, Kevin, let's fast forward because you became successful at, uh, at rugby pretty quickly. 99 to 2004, you were the coach of uh, Rugby USA. And then uh, in 2000, you scored a goal in in Sydney um but then all of a sudden in 2004 you get released from the team because you only come up with a bronze medal is there a story behind that well actually in 99 I was the coach of the development team I was not part of the, the Wikipedia sorry is wrong I was not uh it, it's listed in my hall of fame profile on the US QRA site haven't been able to adjust that but I was not part of the gold medal winning team in Sydney um, so from 2001 to 2004, I was the head coach and really young. Um, you know, I was in my early thirties, uh, when I was coaching the team and in 2002 at the world championship, I was the first coach to actually lose a major competition for the U S. Um, and they decided to keep me on through, uh, the Athens Paralympics and ended up losing to Canada again in the uh, semifinal game. So after the Athens Paralympics, uh, winning the bronze medal, I was dismissed as the head coach and, um, you know, they moved on to, uh, different pastures and, you know, that's part of sport. I mean, I, I live in SEC country where, you know, coaching changes, you know, if, if you're not winning 10 games a season or whatever, it's, it's normal. So the idea of that happening in wheelchair sports is actually kind of refreshing, although it's, uh, not really great to lose your position as the head coach, but at the same time, uh, understand that's part of sport as well.
Of course. So in 2008, ironically, you become coach of the Canadian team, and once again, you get a bronze medal. Uh, we actually, um, so between 2005 and 2008, Peter Erickson actually contacted me about uh, being involved with the U.S. Uh, wheelchair track team. So I, I took a little hiatus from being involved with wheelchair rugby um, and was involved with wheelchair racing again. And, and really the impetus there was to take some of the athletes that were playing wheelchair rugby and and I really tried to push the quad fields. So um, I, I was thankful in Beijing to have full fields and all the uh, quad events for men and women. Um, that was one of the great things that I think I did in, when I was in that tenured uh, position is really to, to try to really push those elite standards for the quads, really encourage the quads. And not only here in the U.S., but also the international field, because, as you know, the, the idea of encouraging those numbers isn't just from our zone, but it takes all zones and international uh, participation to be involved with that. So that was an interesting kind of thing. And then at the Beijing Paralympics, one of the wheelchair rugby players from Japan says, you need to coach Japan. And, and that kind of got my mind started as far as that international uh, tour with uh, wheelchair rugby. Uh, so after Beijing, I, I stopped coaching um, wheelchair racing. Uh, it really wasn't I felt more like an escort than a coach because really I was taking people, Hey Bob, you need to be at the call. You need your, your event is at this time. You need to be at the, uh, at the tent to get your chair. We'll, we'll get your chair set up. We'll warm up. We'll do a few starts and then we'll go to the call room. That was essentially my job for the, the Beijing cycle. And, um, you know, I was, I appreciate, uh, Peter Erickson and Troy Engel for having me as one of the coaches, but really didn't feel that uh, that was my skill set. So, Got involved, and then I was asked, ironically, by Canada to be their coach, which, you know, the, my career has been really interesting, is that the team that I lost to has asked me to be their head coach. So I applied to be the head coach of Canada. Um, and then at the uh, 2010 World Championships, we ended up uh, in a horrible position. Um, and we, we didn't qualify for the medal round. So I'm thinking, man, my, my career with wheelchair rugby is going to be short-lived. Um, but really got on the development path uh, after that. Hey, Kevin, so let's uh, let's talk a little bit about Tokyo and uh, being involved with the Japanese team. Uh, it was uh, it was pretty apparent from everything that I saw and everything that I read that uh, you guys weren't terribly satisfied with the bronze medal you came away with in the 2020 or 2021 Paralympics. Is that true? Because what I read, I mean, more or less was that it was a bittersweet moment to finish third. Well, everyone strives to win a gold medal. I mean, I think all eight teams that were there, their goal was to win a gold medal. And, you know, you want to be on the podium. So that's, you know, it's a little bit uh, of a, a win, I suppose, to be on the, the podium. But everyone wants to win. And, you know, given my career, I have yet to win a gold medal. Uh, so it's certainly something that I want to achieve as a coach. Is that, And I feel that our team was had the potential to do it. I mean, we had won the, uh, the 2018 World Championship and had beaten – you know, a very strong USA and a strong Australia squad. Um, but Great Britain came out and uh, they outperformed everybody and you know, give them credit. I mean, I think Great Britain did a fabulous job. I think their team was complete and I think they did a very good job and their coaching staff uh, should be commended for the job that they did. You know, Kevin, I don't want to get too deeply into the classification point but system, but what I did read was uh, also that you rely heavily, and I quote, on your so-called low pointers. So knowing that there's eight points on the floor, what's your strategy and what's your feeling about going with more low pointers as opposed to having some of the, the more able big guns on your lineup? Well, we have high pointers, and that's, that's really what the team is founded on, is everyone thinks that it's all about the high pointers, but really you have to back those high pointers up with low pointers. Um, and our low pointers need to be able to step up to that challenge. And I think that's really where Great Britain uh, made their greatest gains were through the, the play of their low pointers, is their ability to pass the ball, their ability to possess the ball, and take some of the punishment from some of the high pointers. And that's really where we need to get a little bit better, um, is our, our 
low pointers need to help our high pointers and they it doesn't need to be a one-sided team because we rely heavily on our high point players and our low point players need to, to get up to that high level international play as well. Your ace, uh, Ikazaki, was quoted as saying that the result in, in, in Tokyo this time around was unsatisfying and a mortifying result. Was he being hev- heavy and hard on himself? Uh, he, all of our players have been very hard on ourselves. Uh, you know, we're competing and we're competing at high level. And, you know, it's little things that I think players need to understand is that, you know, no one player has to take uh, credit or fault for the performance that we had. It's a team game. And that's the thing that, you know, it's it's kind of disheartening to hear players say that. But at the same time, understand, hey, we're, we're trying to uh, – a comment I made to the press is that we feel like we let the whole country down. Um, <laughs> you know, to me, it's uh, – it, Paralympic sport is being taken very seriously. And, and to me, uh, I think that's part of the messaging that he's trying to send uh, to his sponsors, to his supporters – is that, you know, he's not satisfied. And I think that's really the message, is that he trained really hard, he worked really hard to, to achieve the result, um, but it, it wasn't good enough. And to me, that's sometimes the picture. We know as athletes, that's uh, that's part of it, is that, you know, we can give our best, but on any given day, someone else is competing just as hard. Well, Coach, he still came away with a bronze medal. There's a lot to learn. What's next for the Tokyo team? Well, we have preparation. The turnaround for World Championships is very quick uh, next October. So we have a year for World Championships. We have to go through the qualification uh, period, which through COVID and all the quarantine restrictions and things like that, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of rules behind that. So we're really not sure what's next. Uh, competing in a uh, in a pandemic Paralympic Games, you know, we didn't play any competition for two years, and we're not sure what our international schedule is going to be this year. Um, and then we have uh, two years to after that to prepare for Paris. So um, our job is we've got to recruit. You know, our, our, our high point players are in their 40s, um, which they're still performing very, very well. But uh, we don't only want to perform well in Paris, but we want to leave a legacy for the L.A. games and then on to Brisbane. So the idea is that we don't want to just leave it at, hey, we, you won a bronze medal in Tokyo is what are you going to do in Paris, what are you going to do in L.A., and what are you going to do in Brisbane? And that's really part of my job right now. All right, Kevin, on a personal note, I keep seeing all these uh, delicious menu items you're posting on social media. What what would you prefer to have, the Kobe beef burger or the sushi? Uh, Well, the Kobe beef burger is very good. I would would recommend Yakiniku, which is Wagyu beef um, or sukiyaki uh, with Wagyu beef. Um, it's a social setting. A lot of people don't know Japanese food, but uh, it's so much more than sushi and ramen. Uh, I, I would definitely recommend uh, people to explore, try shabu shabu. Um, there's all kinds of great opportunities for food. All right, Kevin Orr, you've been a head coach for several different uh, Paralympic squads. You've done a great bang up job uh, helping, you know, different countries with their developmental systems. And I'd like to thank you for joining us. It was uh, it was really good catching up with you. Thanks. It's great to see you and look forward to uh, our future here in the U.S. as far as what the L.A. Games can bring and uh, continue to bring awareness for Paralympic Games in the United States. Good luck, coach.